with a bang, energy and change came to every part of our universe. Seismic or small, it continues. Change is all around us. Shaped by technology and human ingenuity. We can make it work for you and your business. Um, to talk about me a mentoring journey, I I have been with Accenture for 20 years, uh, a very long time. And actually, what's important to us is our people. Um, we're only as good as the people in our business. And so how we help people in their career journey is through career mentoring. And I've been very lucky myself to actually have some incredible leaders throughout my own personal career journey that have taken an interest in my career have stretched me, have put me into roles that I didn't think I was ready for, but have ultimately made me the leader I am today. And so for me, I really see um, as a leader, it's about being able to pay um, that contribution to someone else's career forward. Being a, a mentor and a career counsellor, there's always lots of um, important moments. Um, but I, honestly, I do think it's about the, the journey itself, but clearly um, some of the, the most rewarding opportunities as a career counsellor or a mentor is actually about being able to give people exciting news about a promotion or um, a salary increase. Um, I almost feel like being able to, to give people that feedback is almost like a reward in itself. Um, and so I, I have... Um, cherish some of those moments. Um, it, it's exciting to see um, how people can see that their their hard work is, is being recognised. So I think the biggest mentoring challenge is actually giving feedback or advice that people don't want to hear. Um, you know, but that's ultimately about what is being a good mentor. It's not always about the positive. Sometimes it's actually about the tough conversations, and that's sometimes when people um, learn and grow the most. For me, I actually think it started as a little girl. Um, I, uh, during the Christmas holidays, used to spend time with my grandparents, and my grandmother married very young and had four boys and um, had a, a career in the late 60s and early 70s, and at the time that wasn't the done thing for women uh, and I've heard many stories around how this all eventuated but as a little girl I would go down and spend time with my grandmother and she became a, a director of Nutramedics and was um, top sales um, across New Zealand for seven years and so my experience as a little girl was working with her doing the stock and inventory um, making up the orders going and visiting the customers and she taught me at a very young age that women have successful careers. So ultimately, I really thought that that was the norm. And I think she's been an inspiration for me um, throughout my life. And she's um, still alive today. And she still uh, wants to know how I'm going uh, in, in my job and is uh, always giving me advice. Absolutely. And I think um, mentoring is, um, it's a relationship. And I think there will be different types of relationships that are required for different points in your career. Um, uh, the one thing that I, I would advise around um, the different types of mentors is, is find someone that works for you um, and, you know, understands you and who you are. Um, and don't be afraid to um, actually change your mentor or change your career counsellor if they're right, not the right person. Um, you know, it might hurt feelings for a few minutes, but ultimately it's about setting yourself up for your future. Well, I think the key thing is that, you know, there has always been technology and digital change, but 
it's fundamentally accelerated um, through the whole COVID situation. So I, I do believe that um, what's going to be important uh, for supporting our rising stars is creating a, a um, environment and a culture where they can continue to grow. And, and, I, and by that, I mean, it's going to need to be a culture where there is continuous innovation and there's the opportunity for growth. And importantly, there is inclusion and diversity um, so that you know everyone can feel a part of that. Um, I think the other thing that needs to the organisations and telcos need to think about is is education. Um, with the pace of technological change, um, what held true today is not going to be um, as relevant tomorrow. Um, you know, we have new jobs um, that are being created. And who knows what those future jobs are going to be, what the new collar skills are going to be. So how do we actually make sure that we are building the foundational skills like critical thinking, like problem solving, um, like ethics, like storytelling? And then how do we actually change the way in which we continue to, to build and nurture skills in those new technology areas that we may not be aware of? I think that's going to be absolutely key. Continuous learning. So hello and welcome. Um, thank you for joining. My name is Vicky Slight and I'm the Director for Human Factor and Diversity and Inclusion here at TM Forum. I'm really excited to open our Diversity and Inclusion Leadership Roundtable. Uh, and today with a focus on how inclusive design drives innovation, a topic that's not only close to my heart, but I know to Sebastian and the rest of the expert panelists. So this is a learning session for you um, with topic specific key learnings and takeaways. Presentation free, it's interactive as well. So please, please do feel, you, uh, feel free to use the chat box, introduce yourselves, ask as many questions and get involved. I'll be sure to drop the questions um, into the panelists as we go along. Um, we'll also be running a poll during the session, so please watch out for that. And of course, as always, you can follow and comment at hashtag TMF Digital on both Twitter and LinkedIn. So it is with great delight that I want to hand over to introduce not only our sponsor, but the amazing Sevasti Wong, Managing Director, Global Talent and Organization Consulting at Accenture, and also one of the founding members of our TM Forum DNI um, Council Advisory Board. So Sevasti, um, welcome to you, and please do tell us more about what we can expect from today's session. Thank you very much, Vicky. A very big warm welcome from my side too. Thank you to all of our roundtable participants for making the time to join us today and a big warm welcome to our audience as well. My name is Savasi Wong. I will be the moderator for our diversity and inclusion roundtable today. We're here to explore uh, the impact that the crisis, you know, the last seven months has had on the broader diversity and inclusion agenda across our industry and more specifically explore together what we think about, uh, you know, when we think about inclusive design, has the crisis taken us forward or taken us a step back when it comes to innovation? And to clarify, when we talk about diversity um, at the TM Forum and on our diversity and inclusion um, council, we are talking about diversity in its broadest term. So everything from gender, age, sexual orientation, ethnicity, disability, and on many, many other fronts too. We will explore today uh, during our um, discussion um, you know, whether this crisis has accelerated this agenda in any way. Personally, as I sit here today in October 2020, I'm hugely excited about the elevated status that our industry has right now, as everyone recognizes the role that operators play when it comes to the rapid digitization of our societies. And on the plus side, if we can harness all the diverse voices across our industry and our ecosystem, I think we've got a fantastic opportunity to go beyond connectivity and to get to the products and services that so many of our customers are looking to us to provide. 
On the other side, the crisis has meant pervasive homeworking. We're all coming to you today from our individual homes, and that therefore means that people might feel less visible than they have been in the past. And we're now in a, at a point in time when even keeping our camera on from morning to night seems a, a hardship and you know, difficult for us to do. So I look forward to exploring both the thoughts of our audience and we very much encourage you to be as interactive as possible on the group chat, as well as hearing more from our, our round table participants. So who do we have with us here today? Well, by way of introduction, we have Vicky Nisbet, who is the Area Vice President, uh, Comms and Media UK from Salesforce. We have Rachel Hyam, Managing Director of IT from British Telecom. We've got Edith Dubdavani Aronson, who is our Head of Corporate Responsibility and Inclusion from Amdocs. We've got Joe Johnson, who is the VP for Product Development and Management, Kinetic Consumer and Business by Windstream. And last but very much not least, my esteemed colleague, Barbara Harvey, who's the Managing Director of Accenture Research. And to kickstart our session, I'm going to now hand over to Barbara, who will share her perspective on how inclusive design drives innovation. And then we will start the conversation um, across the roundtable participants. Barbara, over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Savasti. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Um, last summer, in a very different world, I was at a disability inclusion concert, conference. And a young woman, her name was Manakshi Das, walked onto the stage. She was visibly nervous and shaking. And she began to speak and you could see her absolute courage for she spoke with a really strong stutter. To a silent audience, she explained how as a child, she really struggled to be heard, how teachers in class silenced her, how she was barred from attending debates and that none of the teachers and people around her saw the fierce intelligence that was locked inside. Now she managed to get onto a disability focused program and she won a software engineering internship at Qualcomm. And finally, her talent shone through. She was brilliant. Today, She's at university with a permanent job at Microsoft waiting for her when she finishes. In her words, disabled people are innovative because they already know of solutions to work around their disability to get work done. And right now, as Sebasti said, demand for skills in this industry are soaring. Demands in software are soaring and the industry lacks female talent and talent from ethnic minority backgrounds. But I wonder if an employer would have spotted Manakshi's talent without the intervention that came her way. I hope so. But I worry that for many like her, well-paid jobs, challenging jobs, interesting roles are all but a dream. Now, the question I've been asked to address to get our discussion going today is how inclusive design drives innovation. And I'm gonna do that by looking at four things. I'm gonna talk about why it matters. I'm gonna talk about what the starting point is. Well, actually, I'm then going to talk about what's happened since that starting point, what's happening now because of COVID. And last but not least, we'll look at ways in which we can drive innovation through diversity and inclusion. So let's start with why it matters. And I think there are three big reasons why it matters. The first, it matters because you want to keep and attract the best customers and the best employees into your business. They increasingly expect it. Just under a third of customers and about the same of employees in a study that I worked on last year fall into a group that I would call crusaders. They're a really interesting group because we tend to think of them as being Gen Z and millennials. In fact, they weren't. They cut right across all genders, all ages, all backgrounds. They were not just millennials. In that group, however, it included your best customers, your highest worth customers. And it also included your most valuable employees, employees with the most difficult to find skills who are most mobile 
in this world where there is fierce competition for these kinds of skills. Three in five of these crusaders have already talked publicly about a topic that they don't feel happy about. They're your best customers, they're your best employees, and they are vocal. So what it tells us that if you are going to attract and retain the best customers, if you're going to keep these people coming to you, you have to be very careful about what you sell, how you sell it, where you sell it, and who sells it. Because they're looking out for how you're doing in all of those areas. The second reason is that it matters because diverse teams drive innovation. Now, Accenture, I lead our research team, and much of the research that I've been doing over the last five years is looking into the interaction between workplace culture and how that helps people to thrive. So how it helps people to advance, how it helps people to stay happy and engaged at work. But in the course of doing that research, we discovered a really startling relationship, a relationship between culture, where we work, and the willingness and ability that individuals have to be innovative at work. So between culture and innovation. Now we measure workplace culture by looking at a massive list of attributes, things that happen around you in the workplace that we know when they're present in greater numbers result in people being more able to advance and happier in their work. And we measure innovation mindset, that willingness and ability to be innovative by looking at factors that are essential to be able to innovate. Like, for example, attending things like this, where you can share ideas and think beyond the own box of your own organization. And it turns out these two things rise hand in hand. And in fact, for every 10% improvement that you make to the culture that someone works in, you get a 10% improvement in innovation mindset. Now let me give you a sense as to the power of this effect. If you compare the innovation mindset of individuals working in the least inclusive, diverse and diverse companies, and you compare that with those working in the most inclusive and diverse companies, innovation mindset jumps from a tiny eight, eight out of 100 in those least inclusive and diverse environments to a stunning 92 out of 100 in the most inclusive and diverse companies that's 11 and a half times higher. Your employees are 11 and a half times more willing and be able to innovate in those more inclusive cultures. And boy, do we need innovation in all our industries here and now with the world we're facing around you. And, and one comment on this, it's not just it, it, it's not just the diversity that matters, it's the inclusion, the sense of belonging, that unlocks that power. And just one last comment on this relationship. I studied that relationship between culture and how people thrive across all different types of individual. I've looked at it for disability. I've looked at it for ethnicity. I've looked at it for gender. I've looked at it amongst LGBT professionals. And whatever group you look at, that relationship holds true. When you improve culture, you improve advancement. When you improve those things, you have the ability to innovate more. And the third and final reason is simple. If you don't get this right, you risk everything. You risk your reputation, you risk your brand, you risk your company's viability. Okay, so the second thing I wanted to talk about is where do we start from? Where do we start right now? So let's rattle through some pretty sobering facts. Start with gender. For every 100 male managers in the world's workplaces, there are only 34 women. And in the US, the percentage of women working in technology has actually fallen from 1984 to where we are today, from 35% in 84 to 32% today. It's going down. The World Economic Forum determined that cloud computing was the most male profession in the world, about 12% women, um, followed not long behind data and AI at 26% women. We're really losing out in gender equality in the, in the technology workforce. When it comes to disability, 15% of the population have a disability and they hold about $8 trillion worth of spending power. 
most people with a disability, that's 84% of them, were not born with it. Most develop it while they're of working age. And yet, across the world, we see that working age people with disabilities are employed at a much lower rate than those who have not got a disability. And when you combine things like, for example, if you look at young people with disabilities, you see in the UK, for example, much higher rates of unemployment. Now, when it comes to ethnicity, the story is complex and it is nuanced. You know, for example, if you take the UK again, there are relatively high rates of employment among those from ethnic minorities, but it's still about 10 percentage points below those of their white peers. But it masks a much less positive story. Access to better paid work, more secure work is very challenging for many ethnic minority populations. You know, for example, you see a much uh, higher proportion of ethnic minorities in temporary or zero hours contracts. There are today only three black Fortune 500 CEOs and only two women have ever held uh, a CEO role in an S&P uh, top 500 company. For LGBT professionals, on the face of it, it actually looks more hopeful. Um, the percentage of LGBT, LGBT professionals who reach manager level in their organisations about the same as their non-LGBT peers. Um, but only 31%, only a third of those who are LGBT feel able to be completely open at work. And that rather worryingly falls to only 20% when you look at global leaders. And even among those LGBT leaders, only half of them say that their company, their own company, is very welcoming towards other members of the LGBT plus community. That's pretty scary. So we're not starting from a great place. And then we had COVID. And I love this quote from the Institute of Fiscal Studies. They summed up the impact of COVID-19 on inequality by saying this, the specific nature of the economic shock associated with COVID-19 has interacted with many deep and old inequalities. And the result of that is that on every dimension we look at, inequality is getting worse. And we're only nine months in to what's gonna be, by the look of it, a pretty long ride. Now, I realize that this sounds really gloomy, but actually, I don't see it that way. I believe we've come to a really rare fork in the road one of those moments when actually everybody sits back and we think, what way next? We have to choose where we go next. And we have a chance to create a very different kind of future. People talk about building back better. I think it's about building forward better. And I want to give you one example of what I mean by this. And I want to look back at women. Before COVID, at the start of 2020, the World Economic um, the World Economic uh, Foundation, World Economic Forum, sorry, <laughs> forecast that the gender gap will close in 2120. That's a hundred years from now. In some work that we've recently finished looking at the women's 20, we discovered that if we do not act, we risk setting back that timeline by 51 years, 150 years till gender equality. That's three generations of women. But if we act, if we implement the recommendations that make sense around gender equality across our businesses, across our world, actually, we could bring gender equality forward 59 years. Just in the case of gender, never mind disability, never mind ethnicity, never mind all those other things which are happening at the same time, just in the case of gender, 110 years of equality lie in our hands. Think of the opportunity if we take that more broadly. So what can we do as businesses? Four things. Inclusive workplaces where everyone can thrive. Inclusive decision making, bringing in the voices and opinions that are missing and that would otherwise hurt underrepresented employees. Inclusive work design, focusing on skills and aptitudes, the potential for individuals to retrain and that rejects out of date assumptions about what it takes to do a job. And finally, inclusive restructuring and talent strategies, tapping into hidden talent pools across industries and across the world, in people that are not even in the labour market today. Sevasti, thank you.
Thank you very much, Barbara. Lots of food for thought there. A masterclass almost in its own right. So lots of uh, places that we can take that conversation. So let's start by coming to each of our uh, roundtable participants. I'd love to hear one learning from each of you on the topic of inclusion that Barbara has said is so important when we think about uh, innovation. Uh, from the from the past seven months. So Rachel, I wonder if I could come to you first. Absolutely. Uh, well, we've had to learn new ways of ensuring that everyone's voice is included while we're working remotely. And that changed again, actually, when some people returned to the office and we started to see a hybrid mode of working. We've organically formed new behaviours and etiquettes, such as using the raised hand tool to prevent talking over each other, working harder to bring those who are more introverted into the conversation, circulating meeting summaries and inviting ideas that come after the meeting for those that are more reflective. Um, we went out to our whole team with practical guides and training for those who chair meetings. And now we're sending out new surveys and having lots of team conversations. So we continue to pick up new issues around inclusion as we continue to react to the pandemic. Lots of practical tips. And you're so right that again, we forget we're still in the pandemic and it's had different mm -hmm. phases. So of course you're also adapting some of those inclusive actions that you're taking. Edith, can we come to you next? What have you learned? Thank you, Sebastian. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, I want to relate to uh, what Rachel said, moving to a virtual era where uh, each and one of us has the same square in Zoom is actually an advancing factor for inclusion because suddenly um, it's not only about how loud is your voice or how senior is your position in the company. Each and one of us has the same size of square in Zoom, which is a great opportunity. Uh, also, we know the downside of it, right? Um, working remotely, uh, you know, connecting very much to right, what Rachel said is uh, also a, um, a factor that takes us back in some ways. Uh, so if I need to summarize what we took from the past uh, few months is uh, that we have huge potential here. Uh, it's really the time relating to what Barbara said. We need to do to make the right decisions. Uh, we just uh, launched today an internal campaign called uh, Let's Take Five, where we are really encouraging everyone to create meaningful boundaries and acknowledge the differences that we have with one another, respect one another, and think global and inclusive. I think uh, let's take five and uh, you know see uh, how we can uh, push towards the advancing in 59 years rather than going back. So thank you. Fantastic. And I love the idea Zoom tiles or Zoom squares as an equalizer. From, a, from an inclusion and a diversity perspective. Uh, uh, Vicky, shall we come next to you? Yeah, hi, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, interesting, of course, I've got exactly the same experiences as the previous two comments with regards to the changes and the impact of um, working remotely. And my favorite thing is the new little hands that we get on Google hand, hand out, Hangouts. So I can double put my hand up both um, electronically and physically to get attention. But I think on a, on a serious note, as a, as a leader and, and being a member of a team, it's really heightened for me the need to take responsibility to let all those voices come through. So in a way, a downside of the tiles is sometimes you've got faced with in my case, when I'm in that cloud computing industry, I have a screen full of white middle aged men looking back at me with my face somewhere in there. And it can be almost more intimidating and undoubtedly they're going to have strong voices, opinions. And so as a woman in this industry, I think it's more made it's made me think even more how to balance that because I don't want to cut across anyone. I don't want to interrupt anybody. I don't want to be seen as that forceful woman who's uh, being too direct, but I need to be able to get my voice heard. And, and I'm not shy, so I'm, I'm pretty cool with that. But it's actually those that aren't necessarily extrovert. How do I get my team to be heard? How do I get those on the Zoom who wouldn't naturally want to stick their hand up, you know, virtually or otherwise? Uh, it's about taking the time to ask opinions of other people to make sure everybody is literally included yes keeping keeping everyone being part of that conversation yeah that's absolutely. absolutely one of our responsibilities but hard much harder i think in the in the era of covid joe shall we come to you next well thank you everyone i appreciate savasti being on the panel today uh, I agree with everybody everything that everybody 
what he says. Um, you know, however, I think that there's a huge opportunity to um, address um, how we Zoom and how we Google and all these things um, from an interactive perspective, something I'm gonna call the insertion principle and I've been speaking to for over a year now is that it's basically the idea that we as leaders need to recognize that people may not volunteer their voices via Zoom. They may not turn their cameras on. So, you know, I, I want to see my people and my team members because as we are in product development, we're talking about innovation, we're bringing diverse people together. You know, and as Barbara indicated, we want diversity of thought and that is powerful. And sometimes it's interesting because thought is not necessarily just verbal. And something that's being removed from the equation in our interactions is, is the human factor element of seeing each other. When we may not like something that we hear, we may have a facial expression. I want to see it. And, you know, I want to see it over video. So I know if I say something or uh, someone else on the team is offering an idea and you may not agree with it, I want to see, I want to see you roll those eyes. I want to see your disagreement because then I know that as a leader, I need to insert myself and ask you directly and implement a Socrates method where, okay, well, what's your perspective, Savasti? What's your perspective, Vicky? And, and then that way we can engage in that dialogue and bring together the diverse individuals on my team that we have cultivated and, and that will enrich the process. So that's what I see happening. So I agree with everybody, but I also see that if we're not careful and we as leaders don't insert ourselves to elicit that feedback, then you know, that, that's, that's not good. I, I look forward to exploring the insertion principle with you further during this conversation, Joe, because I think it's a, it's a really interesting one for our audience to hear a little bit more about. So thank you for sharing that. Barbara, what have you learned in the last seven months? We've learned one, so much, haven't we? Haven't we? So much. Um, I think for me, it's, it's about what's invisible. It's what we can't see that I find really, really interesting. Things that we don't notice, unintended consequences. So for example, we think very, uh, we've thought a lot, we've cared a lot about parents during the lockdown. Perhaps we haven't noticed as much people who are carers rather than parents. And um, they're much less visible. You don't see their children popping into the back and waving over the top of the, the Zoom call for you. Um, they're more hidden. Um, if you think of a colleague of mine who is hard of hearing um, and um, she finds lip reading on Zoom really difficult. So now she has someone who signs for her. So it's those unintended invisible things, Savasti, I think we have to pay a great deal of attention to. Mm. I think that's such a crucial point. And I'm actually deaf in my left ear. So if you see me going a little bit like this, it's not because I've lost the camera, but genuinely I also have the same, the same challenge with, uh, with hearing. So uh, I can absolutely uh, empathize with that. So let's if perhaps- just, If I can just drop a question in quickly, oh, Savetti, that's please. coming from Valentina. And I think it's relevant to what we've just been talking about. So if somebody is talking and they're on that tile, um, it's, it's a case of how do we get the culture right? It's still the question of, of who, is, who is louder, um, which I think just refers to what everybody was talking about. Um, and I think I just want to bring in the, the poll at this point as well, because we've been talking about um, the, you know, about COVID and the impact. And obviously some people are going back to the office, but a lot are still working from home. So I think it's interesting. We've asked people, do you find in your organizations and teams that working from home is either an equalizer or it's showing up new inequalities? Um, and it's, it's an equalizer is coming up at 63%. Um, and 73, uh, sorry, and 37% showing up new inequalities which I think is interesting because then how do you deal with onboarding for new staff and for young people who've perhaps got flatmates, roommates, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that kind of throws up some questions as well there. And again, I think I love that point. I think also different stages of the pandemic. So in the early lockdown, we were all working from home. I think to um, the point that Rachel just made, now we in some cities are moving to a more hybrid model what does that mean? That also takes very different 
um, ways of working in order to make everyone feel both visible and to feel included. And I, and I think just on that topic real quick is I think it's really important that as managers and leaders that we recognize that um, different um, people have different needs and mental health needs because I think that is becoming a major concern on my part as I have carers on my team, people that are caregiving, people that have been in their homes for a, a, a long time. And you know the, the connections, the social disconnection is weighing on a lot of people. And I really believe that as leaders, we also need to make sure that you know we're asking people how they feel and including them in that dialogue, but that we're also flexible enough in order to give people the mental health time that they need to be really productive and innovative to be those key contributors. So I just wanted to throw that out there too. Yeah, it's a great point. And I know you've got a, a, a strong ally in Barbara who has dedicated a lot of her working life to help us from a, from a mental health allies perspective as well. And I think speaking of allies, this is the answer to Valentina's question about, you know, what will make the difference when someone doesn't have the loudest voice in Zoom. Um, so it's the more we have allies within the organization that make sure that people are heard, that make sure that people have their chance, that make sure to say, hey, Sebasti, I didn't hear you in this meeting. What's your opinion? This is the key to solve it. Yeah, lovely. Really nice build. Thank you very much, Edith. So if we now move on to the first topic for today, and that is very specifically around inclusive tech. And Rachel, perhaps I can come to you first uh, and ask you as a prominent woman in tech and also as a sponsor of diversity and inclusion more broadly, if you can share some thoughts on how inclusive tech, not just from a gender perspective, um, but broader has been showing up during the past seven months? I think like um, most organizations, we've been benefiting from the rapid innovation in collaboration and productivity tools. We've seen features such as live captions and transcripts appear for those with hearing difficulties, auto translation to help those who don't speak the same native language have a conversation. And things like highlighting word structures in different colors to help those with dyslexia which has been fantastic to see. Um, internally within BT, we've been adopting tools like augmented reality to help train our field engineers. And we've seen that that's helped those who prefer a more practical and visual learning mode become proficient faster and they can get out into the field and connect back to an expert and feel supported to help our customers when before they would have felt uh, very nervous of, of being out there on their own. Uh, we've also been exploring how integrating our consumer applications and interfaces with devices such as Alexa, Google Home and Apple HomePod could possibly make interaction with our customer services easier for those with visual impairments or issues with physical movement. But actually, I think it's adopting design thinking as a practice right across our IT organization and layering in inclusive design into that that's had our biggest impact. It's meant that we're naturally more inclusive as we design any product and service experience or journey for customers and colleagues. We've developed a really rich set of personas that include a very broad range of diverse characteristics. And we use those to test if everything we do meets everyone's needs. We recently used them to develop the requirements for our first new campus building in Birmingham and pull together a fantastic group of colleagues into an inclusive design council and they're going to oversee the physical design of all of our future buildings. So I think having design thinking at the very heart of everything we do has really um, flipped the switch for us. So many ideas and tips there. And again, it really goes to show, I think during the past seven months, how much prior investments in technology have really paid off for organizations mm. that had made them prior to the pandemic. And again, I think it's just, you know, the amount of returns, therefore, during the pandemic of all those examples you just shared with us um, is, is just phenomenal, right? Um, and I think it's just, you know, it's a very nice link to, you know, technology is absolutely inextricably linked with the human experience. And I'm just wondering, Edith, from your perspective, I know that Amdocs has been 
trailblazing when it comes to digital inclusion um, during the crisis. And I was wondering whether you could share some thoughts or perhaps a story of how you've been helping to create a better connected society. Of course, and a second before that, I think the fact that we're all here and representing different companies in our industry, for example, Rachel came to speak with our team at Andox a few years ago, and you know, bringing different uh, perspectives and coming to one another to speak and uh, putting aside, you know, all the day-to-day, uh, -day, uh, um, you know, work and sometimes even competition. Uh, so I really call on all of us to go to one another and share our perspectives and uh, help us learn. Rachel's uh, conversation to our teams was very meaningful in the way that we uh, we did things after that. So thanks again, uh, Rachel. And to your uh, question, uh, Sebasti, you know, for us, as a people-centric uh, organization, we are looking at inclusion really from how we design our workplace all the way to how we design our product and, and a strong connection to the impact that we make on society, on how we actually pay it forward. And, you know, if I'm relating to Rachel's uh, comment on design thinking, so design thinking is a very, very strong uh, mechanism uh, for us as well. You know, uh, one of our, uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, teams uh, use design thinking in order to co-create with low income users to prioritize household expenses. Um, we have accessibility design guidelines that, uh, that we use. Um, and so, and when we're looking on, you know, on our purpose, what's our mission is to really enrich lives and progress society for a better connected world. And, and having, you know, one thing is to have diverse teams around the table and create inclusiveness inside. Another thing is to see how we design our products in the two examples that I, that I gave and we have more so that people who are, and for me inclusive design is one term, but actually I want us to start with eliminating exclusive design and then move forward to inclusive design. And if we start with eliminating exclusion, uh, uh, we would drive forward uh, uh, faster. But so how do we design our product that way? And eventually what do we do really for the sake of the society? And during COVID, uh, I don't know what about you, but I can survive a few hours without drinking water, but half an hour without internet and I'm losing it, right? Like internet and connectivity became the bottom of Maslow and what we need in order to survive. And COVID specifically got us all in. We're all, we were all, you know, stuck within uh, four walls. And for those of us who were lacking connectivity or lacking the knowledge of what to do with COVID connectivity, speaking of mental health and not only, so even a survival mode was critical. And we built um, a call center uh, that was operated by our volunteers that uh, until now it's working for almost seven months. Um, our, volunteer, our volunteers are in touch with the elderly who don't know how to do FaceTime, don't know how to do uh, Zoom calls or WhatsApp calls. And we take them hand in hand and we really teach them the skills that they're missing in order to be digitally in included. Uh, so for us, digital inclusion is, you know, making sure everyone have access and that they know what to do with it. But in times like COVID, um, where we realize that to be able to do everything today, we, you need to know what to do with this uh, with these digital tools, the amazing tools that we all here on the line are able to bring to this world. We need to do the extra mile to embrace and bring in the people who are otherwise excluded. Elderly are one, uh, one population, but we have too many populations that uh, are lacking the ability to become digital citizens uh, in this world. I love, and you heard it here first, we can do without coffee, but not connectivity. <laughs> so I think that's a, that's a great point. And, you know, if only I'd known earlier in the pandemic, my very young 67 year old mum didn't know how to use Zoom until halfway through, as Rachel knows, because I remember speaking to her about it. So we definitely would have, we'd, we'd have loved that service to teach her how to use Zoom. So thank you so much for sharing that. If we move on to another topic now and we turn our attention more to um, innovation in product development, um, you know, of course, this is something that is uh, gaining a lot of prominence during the crisis, how we um, innovate responsibly, because, of course, in the crisis, when we're in a very different mode, we also sometimes, um, you know, as well as that uh, losing the visibility, we might also lose some of the responsibility. So 
Um, there are a number of organizations and a, a number of tech companies that really have been leading the way when it comes to responsible tech and responsible innovation. Um, and in fact, Salesforce has very recently published an awesome set of guidelines on responsible technology. And as we have Vicky with us today, I was wondering whether we could come to you to tell us a little bit about those recently published guidelines and more importantly, also talk to us about how Salesforce are keeping diverse voices front and center when it comes to product innovation. Thank you. Yes, I'm probably uh, more qualified to talk about the latter, but I'll give it a go. So uh, I, I guess to start with, really, the fact that I work for Salesforce, I do feel incredibly lucky about that. I mean, um, though most people will have heard who we are and what we stand for. And, and when I'm interviewing people, they genuinely say, is it really true? Is the culture really like that? And the answer is undoubtedly yes. So equality is one of our four main core values and it's in everything we are and everything we do. So um, the result of that means that we work with people who are, all work for the same company because of the culture and because of the values, which gives a really different feel whenever you're working in close contact, even remotely. Um, and a lot of that is through education and sharing and through the through the pandemic, we've done an awful lot of increased communication, which I think is an upside, which I might mention later. With regards to the paper, I think it's an interesting one because um, it's something that um, has been front of mind for us way before COVID. So I wouldn't say that anything's necessarily changed in our approach to um, inclusive design when it comes to, to software and technology, um, but it's definitely something that we talk about and we're very conscious of. And I think if you look at the way that AI, for example, is growing and machine learning, and we're all talking about whether it's going to take over the world. And the thing that puts the fear of God in me is the fact that a lot of the, the, the learnings that come from the machines actually can be biased themselves. And then if you look behind the machines and you look at the reduction in in, in minorities in the industry, then who, who's writing these algorithms? Who's, who's, who's designing this software other than white middle-aged men, I'm sorry to say. So, um, so we have to be very conscious that we've got that in mind when we are designing these products. And we need to understand that if a question is to do with um, race or gender, then it cannot be taken into account when it comes to those kind of um, decision making of machine learning. But it also comes to things like regions and areas, you know, is a poor area going to be treated differently from an affluent area. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, you need to know and be aware that bias can exist within machines. And therefore, you need to do a few things. You do need to look at where does it come from? Who does it impact? If it's there, what, what does it mean? And what's the impact of it? But when you look behind that, I do think that it comes down to three main things, which is first and foremost, employee education. So everything that's been said about um, diversity and inclusion here is even more important when it comes to tech, because we need to embrace the, the diversity of our society to ensure that that is reflected through all of the design that we can bring to our products. And then we continue to educate. We continue to, to I mean, at Salesforce, we we do education and enablement on steroids. We have Trailhead, which is a, you know, a free online training, and we are almost weekly being asked to do uh, different things to, to learn with the changes. And then there's product development, and those people and those employees roll into product de development. That's not necessarily enough. So we need to target our product de development to develop ethical features, to actually consciously ensure that whatever it is we're designing and releasing has an ethical nature to it. And then we roll that forward into our customers. The customers are our focus throughout everything that we do. Um, so we need to encourage our customers to use our software responsibly and feedback onto areas that they don't like or they don't find inclusive. So we can then revolve, evolve and, and um, uh, make improvements and developments moving forward. Um, and I would say overall, even every way that I look at this, it still comes back to the people. We still need to hire the right people with the right diverse backgrounds and then educate them to stay aware of what they're doing and their surroundings. And if we keep doing that and we keep talking about it and we keep bringing it to the top of people's lists, then we will make a difference. We will change things over time. Thank you for sharing, Vicky. Again, it's great to hear 
just all of the different ways that you tackle that to make sure that we're not seeing some of those unintended um, consequences from a bias perspective. And I think that also leads on nicely, Joe, to come to you and hear a little bit more about what you're doing. And again, to touch again on that insertion principle. So um, great, thank you. Um, and, you know, I think I totally agree with everything Vicky says. We use Salesforce and, um, you know, we have many of those same practices internally. Um, and I want to touch on a couple of points that she said. You know, I, I'm going to give you two examples and a personal example. Um, the, the first thing is it relates to the, um, the, the, this idea of inserting talent. It's not necessarily about a person. It's about creating diversity of thought. And from my perspective over product, I need as many ideas as possible. And I need ideas that are relevant. And so, you know, in an area where I had to actually implement this insertion principle, that's what I call it, is, you know, and this fundamentally requires leaders to be more active. It requires leaders to be really involved. And we can't just rely on people. We have to be the checks and balances. And um, I remember looking at the um, uh, requirements matrix from our product that we just launched at the end of last year. And, and, and then we did a subsequent major update at the beginning of this year. And I saw the requirements matrix and I have a lot of history and UIX experience and I saw a huge gap in um, the requirements around the elderly and being able to support dynamic and modular based um, design and interfaces, both on the desktop and mobile. And when I, when I questioned the team about this, they said, well, we didn't get that feedback from our, our requirements. And I'm like, well, why not? And so I had to actually go on to another person on my team who fits that demographic and insert them into this other project to provide that feedback. And so that was pretty uh, uh, relevant. And then, but in the reason why I did that, because it was meaningful to the product itself to make sure that it was fully inclusive. It wasn't that we just included someone in the diversity of thought, the outcome, the outcome, it prevented much, it, it prevented rework that would have been required had we not caught that at the beginning because we never would have rolled it to production without those capabilities, right? That's the first example. The second example is we talked about unconscious bias in uh, technology and artificial intelligence. And, you know, I wanna say is we got a bigger problem with unconscious bias from us, us people, right? And because we're the ones creating the AI, we're the ones creating the marketing, we're the ones creating the imagery. And for the same product, I have a great, wonderful marketing team that works with us and they're fabulous. But the problem is, is they all look the same. They're all uh, Gen X, millennials. Um, they fit a certain characteristic. And when I was looking at all the, the marketing and for the, and the online advertising for the product, I was like, oh, this looks great. The content's fabulous. It looks um, beautiful. And then the next day I would see the, our online ads. I'm like, oh, this is great. And it looks beautiful. But then I said, well, wait a second. And I called a meeting and I said, I need to see everything laid out on a table. And, and it was shocking. When I saw everything laid out on the table, it was a white millennial family, a white millennial couple, you know, a couple in their um, 30s. It was a, a couple riding their bikes. And I was like, wait a second, you guys. And it was just an unconscious bias because we had different people working on different um, pieces of the puzzle, but it took inserting me into that process and checking and balancing the viewpoints and questioning it and saying, you guys, we gotta, we gotta fix this. And so we were able to catch everything before we created it. We went to market with a fully inclusive campaign. And the reasoning behind that is, is I wanted our customers to feel included in the product because, you know, to the earlier points, a, you know, if our customers feel included in the product, they're going to purchase the product. They need to see themselves in the product. And lastly, I will say this just a real quick gambit, you know, a 
I saw this in real life motion a week and a half ago. I've been going to a gospel choir therapy workshop and it's way outside my comfort zone. I don't sing at all. And so I sat down and I'm listening and she's like, oh, you know, sopranos, altos, basses, come here, go there. And, and it was in that moment, I was like, okay, I, I, you know, I'll do what I need to do. And apparently I can sing. I never knew I could, but, you know, interestingly enough, as the choir director, I saw her immediately go, wait a second, your voice isn't right, but your voice is right for the sopranos or you're right. Your voice isn't right for the basses. It's right for the altos. And what I saw in that moment was, wow, these are many scrum teams. She's a scrum leader. And I recognized, wow, we need to open up our talent pool to um, choir directors here and musicians, right? When we know musicians make the best programmers, but ultimately, you know, when we extrapolate and start connecting the dots from other things, we got to challenge ourselves as leaders. We got to get outside of our comfort zones. We got to be bold. We got to be observant and we got to speak up. I love it, Joe. I love those examples. And I really love the idea of us going away and asking ourselves, who do we need to insert into this conversation, into this group, uh, into this scrum to make it um, more diverse in terms of that diversity of thought. So thank you so much for sharing it. You're not going to believe this, but we are almost at time. So to round out our discussion, what I would love to do is uh, do a, a, a rapid fire round and go around each of our participants and ask them for one practical tip on how we can accelerate the inclusion uh, agenda in our industry. So Vicky, could I perhaps come to you first? You can, I'll be quick. Um, for me, I think it's all about education. I think um, communication and education has been increased in some way during covid for example webinars such as this i'm sure if we're all running around busy lives and heading for the tube or trying to commute home we wouldn't necessarily have time for things like this i know in salesforce we've had uh, with black lives matter there were loads of um fabulous webinars that we had where employees were able to share their own experiences of how it had impacted them that we all dialed in for we all listened to so i think we've had more exposure so my thing would be more allies, more education, more um, uh, communication of people's stories, and then we might just change things. Thank you very much. Rachel? Uh, I think it's to really amplify the effect of, our, of the ecosystems we all sit within. So share our best practice, share the things that are working well. Uh, with our, our our vendor partners and with our customer partners um, to make sure that we, we can all move forward faster together. Thank you. Edith? Um, so I'm joining uh, both uh, Rachel and Vicky and I want to add that uh, for me, you know, an average person takes about 35,000 decisions a day. It's a crazy number. A lot of it is unconsciously, right? So I think uh, bringing the unconscious bias and putting it on the table in front of our faces and taking the time when making decisions and making them less intuitive so that we can really think of the diversity uh, that we want to create around the table. Thank you. Joe? Yeah, I would say um, I agree with everybody, but I, I agree with the education bit. But I also believe that we as leaders just we need to we need to speak up and we need to be bold and we need to challenge our own leaders to think differently, have different perspectives and, you know, um, challenge the status quo and to support that more diverse environment of inclusion and get people on video. You got to see them. I love it. And Barbara, would you like to bring us home with your top tip? So I think we're very good at measuring diversity and we're not as good at measuring inclusion. So my challenge to everyone is measure how inclusive your teams are and then you can unlock that potential of all that amazing diverse talent you've worked so hard to bring in. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our roundtable participants. Thank you to all of you that have joined us on the group chat as well. That is all we have for you today. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.
Thank sure. you. Everyone. Yeah. Bye bye.